Welcome, everyone. Thank you for uh, logging on and attending this evening's program. My name is Matt Schumann. I am on the programming team here at Cary Library. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to thank the generous donors to the Cary Library Foundation for helping make programs like tonight's possible. And to introduce our speaker, uh, Bill Getty, he's the founding, <coughs> founding sanctuary director of Mass Audubon's Joppa Flats Education Center in Newburyport and now the president of the Friends of Parker River National Wildlife Refuge. Since 1985, Bill has led natural history travel programs throughout the United States and to all seven continents. And Bill will be back on uh, Tuesday, October 24th to go back to a travel program with Exploring South Carolina's Coastal Lowlands. So you can sign up on the Cary Library website. Uh, and now please welcome Bill Getty. Well, good evening. Thank you very much, Matt. I would very much appreciate your help. Uh, and uh, I just want to remind everyone how important uh, your support of the library is. I mean, to me, I give a, a lot of talks for libraries. And to me, they're basically the most important institution we have within our cities and towns because they provide services for such a wide audience. And so if you could support your library, uh, that would be a good thing. Okay, uh, back when the COVID um, panic set in, um, I was looking for, because they basically said you shouldn't go out in public and things like that. So I was looking for a, um, a new subject that I could really explore in, in a lot of detail. Uh, as Matt said, I had a good opportunity, great opportunity to travel a, a lot uh, around the world. And, and I would focus on, on wildlife, uh, mainly birds and mammals and things like that, but I would always include some uh, plant and flower photographs just for interest. So when the pandemic started, I said, geez, I, I need to look at this something that would, is really important and what is around me that doesn't move very fast and then I could photograph. And so I took up the interest in wildflowers. So since then, I've been, I photographed just basically in the Essex County, that's the northeastern part of uh, Massachusetts. I have photographed uh, over 350 species of wildflowers. And so it's been really, really great fun. Um, and so how I started doing these wildflowers, I would organize my presentations in, in chronologically. In other words, in the order in which I saw them come into blossom. So when we're going through this presentation, these are uh, plants, again, that I photographed basically since the middle of August through the end of October, which for all practical purposes for wildflowers is, is just about the, the very end. Again, on a lot of these presentations, all these presentations, I'm hoping is that by, by talking to you about these wildflowers and how excited I am about them, that this will encourage you to get out into the, out in the field. Uh, this is a really nice time of year to be outside. Uh, way back in the early spring, I have presentations that start uh, in mid-March. Uh, and, and most of those wildflowers you're seeing are wildflowers of the forest area. Plants that are growing up before the leaves come on trees. Well, well now we're here in, in August, and this is when really the wildflowers are most prominent in fields and along forest edges, swamps and places like that. So it's, it's really quite change. So again, I'm hoping that um, that this will interest you and you'll go down in the field. Let's just get started. And uh, if I can, okay. First of all, the references that I use, um, there are two books that I really rely on. First of all, is a guy, a field guide to wildflowers of Northeast and North Central North America. That's Roger Torrey Peterson. Now that guide uh, dates back to 1968. The illustrations in that book are fantastic. Okay, they really help highlight the important aids to identification. Uh, the issue with that guide is there's been a lot of changes in taxonomy, in other words, the, the organized organization of wildflowers and with nomenclature, the naming of them. So it's really quite out of date. But if you want a guide that will get you to the uh, the plant really well, that, that is a good one. Another issue that's very favorable to the Peterson Guide, if you look in the index, it will be, the index will be Tansy, comma, common. A lot of the other guides, the um, guides are set up where the index is common Tansy. Well, if you know it's a Tansy, but you don't know it's common Tansy, it's really hard to find 
the plant. So the Roger Tory Peterson is excellent illustrations and uh, the index helps you get there. The other one that I really rely on a lot is Wildflowers of New England by uh, Ted Ellerman, and that's the New uh, England Wildflower Society. That's spectacular. Uh, it's photographs as opposed to illustrations. Uh, it's pretty much up to date, 2016, with the most uh, up to date scientific name. But again, the index is set up so it's common tansy, not tansy common. So you'll know if it's a milkweed, uh, you ha you have to know it's uh, you know a, a common milkweed as opposed to a different kind of milkweed. But those are those are things. Another resource I'd like to bring you to your attention is. The translation of scientific names. Um, I took like seven years of Latin when I was in high school and college, and I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, and so all the scientific names of these plants are in Latin or have been Latinized. In other words, it's an English word that may, has been made. Anyway, Dave's Garden, if you go in there, it will tell you where the origin of the scientific names are. And, and that's a whole new area of tremendous interest. Uh, at least for me. So when, when we go through, I'll be showing you the scientific names of these plants and um, describing where they're they're coming from. So in terms of um, just some, some basic information that we need is the, and par, uh, flower parts in the axle. So an axle is where leaves come to the main stalk of, of the plant. So if we look at the illustration on the right, that's Harry Solomon seal, a real Solomon seal. So not full Solomon seal, but Solomon seal, have the flowers coming from the axles, as you see in this illustration, where that yellow point is. Later on, we'll be seeing axillary uh, goldenrod. And that's, again, the flowers are coming out of the axles, not from the tip of the flower. That's interesting. Petals. Petals would seem to be one of the simplest things that we have to, to think about here in terms of uh, the five radial petals in the case of the hedge bind weed. And then you have bilateral blossoms in the case of the violet, where in the case of the hedge bindweed, all the uh, petals appear the same, where you look at the uh, bilateral plant in case of the violet, they are different. Okay. Now, in terms of the problem with petals, as, as simple as it could be, many wildflowers have structures that appear to be petals, but aren't. Okay, so the, the key thing is if you're going through a, a skill, uh, going through identification process, and they talk about petals, the point being is if it, if it looks like a petal, then consider it a petal. Okay, in the case of this beautiful plant, this is wood anemone from the early spring, start seeing these in the very early April before the leaves uh, uh, get their, their, the trees get their leaves. And the, these are not petals, these are actually sepals. Now, what sepals are, are just modified leaves. But if it looks like a petal, if you're looking up and trying to identify this, notice that this plant has five petals, even though they're actually sepals. Another one that's interesting here, here is the, um, the composite flowers. This is the black-eyed Susan, which is a really common, most of them have gone by now. But then leaf, thin leaves, sunflower, there's still some of these in blossom around. This is a, a composite flower in that, that, that each of those petals is actually a flower by itself. Okay, so you have the, the petals, and we'll see more of this later on. But those, those things that look like petals are actually a complete flower. Okay, okay. And then you have something else, again, the, in the case of the Canada lily, certainly looks like uh, petals, but they're actually tepals. And what tepals are, or, or modifications, well, it's just, it just depends on where they are, okay? They, in this case, it looks like it has all the same petals, but actually some of those are tepals, and some are, tepals are either petals or sepals. So it's, the point being is, if you're trying to identify a, a plant like this, if it looks like a petal, it's a petal. No, petioles, that's where the, that's the stalk of the, the leaf. In this case, you'll see on the thin leaved sunflower, it has a relatively long stalk. That's the petiole. But if you look at the image on the right hand side, that's the sessile leaf bellwort. The leaf basically is just stuck on the stem. So basically, it doesn't have a petiole. And this is going to be important for you when you're going through the identification process. Rhizomes are simply uh, a lot of plants reproduce by rhizomes. They know that they send a root underneath the ground and it pops up 
and another portion of the plant then develops. Okay. Now, sepals. Okay. Now, in the case of the trillium, another very early a wildflower that we see in the year, that it has three petals and three sepals. Again, sepals are modified leaves. In the case of the trillium, those sepals are supporting the petals. In the case of one on the right, which are still in blossom now, it's coming towards the last of the season, but the common evening primrose, notice in this case, instead of supporting the petals, the sepals are reversed, called reflected. So going to the guide, they'll very often ask you about the sepals. Okay, Spadix, that's a, if you're looking at the skunk cabbage, another way, this is a plant that we start seeing in blossom in March, middle of March. Okay, there's the, the spadix is the flowering portion inside, as is the jack in the pulpit. Okay, that's, that's a little flowering portion on the inside. And the spathe, this is, think of it as uh, some of the, all the churches, uh, I guess, especially in the Episcopal church, they often have over the pulpit, they have a sort of a little roof. That's what this looks like, the spathe. And the same thing with the jack in the pulpit. Just some of the parts that you should know about. The wild calla, which is a, uh, wetland plant, uh, acidic wetland plant, has a spathe. Now, a stolen or solen, this is the, one of the beauties or frustrations about plants, wildflowers, is they have many, many different names, common names. This is, I always grew up knowing this is myrtle, okay, but here it's a lesser periwinkle, okay, and this is a, basically, think of it as a stem that lays on the ground, and every once in a while, roots along that stem, forming additional parts of the plant. And a whirl, this, uh, the one on the left is wild cucumber root, and this is, uh, this is actually an important plant for Native Americans, uh, because they used to eat the root. But notice all the uh, the leaves on this, seven of them, are all coming up from one spot on the stem. So in the case of wild cucumber root, it comes up about halfway up the total length, height of the plant. They have a whorl there. And then right underneath where the flowers are going to be, a smaller whorl higher up. And then the star flowers, again, all the leaves are coming out basically from the same spot. Those are important when you're working through the identification process. In terms of the reproductive parts of plants, the, the female reproductive part is the carpal. And a carpal includes the stigma. That's basically where the pollen um, uh, enters into the plant, okay? And the style, and then the ovary where the immature egg uh, seed is, okay? And then in the case of the male portion of the plant, the, the stamens, which include, the stamen includes the anther where the pollen is produced, and the filament, which holds, in some cases, in some plants, holds the, the, the anther way up high, so it can be easily uh, um, touched by insects. And sometimes it's very, very small and down. But I, this is a wood lily. So these are important. And in terms of flower types, we have simple flowers. This is looks pretty complex to me, but these are called simple flowers. And notice in this case, you have a, a whole set of pistils. That, that those are the female portions of the plant, surrounded with a ring of stamens, which are the male portion, surrounded by the petals. And then we saw one of these composite flowers. These are the asters. The composite flowers are the second largest group of flowers. The largest group are the orchids. But here in case of the composite flower, as I mentioned before, you have in the middle, you have the disc florets. In other words, they're disc flowers. And outside, look like petals. Those are the ray, R-A-Y, florets. So this is what uh, a composite flower looks like. So going into the um, species accounts, again, these are, I started this presentation on August 16th mid-August through the end of October. And these are just the, the variety of wildflowers uh, that we have. This And names are always amazing. This is orange grass. Well, it's not a grass at all. It means a flowering plant. And it's orange grass, St. John's wort. St. John's wort gets its name because that's in, in Eurasia, or especially in England, it gets its name St. John's Wood because that's when the flower comes into blossom on the anniversary of the celebration of St. John's Day. Okay, so that's where that, that comes from. And this is a typically disturbed area. This is a native plant, 
but it typically around disturbed area roadsides and things of that nature. It only goes up about, uh, let's say, 12 inches tall. Okay. This is a beautiful plant. This is purely everlasting. And, and it gets its name everlasting because those, those blossoms, both on the plant and if you were to cut them, they, they just last forever. It's a, it's a really beautiful, it's a member of the Astra family. So this is, it has its ray, it has its disc flowers and and doesn't have any ray flowers. Those are those are sepals underneath. So it comes in all kinds of different varieties. The the petals that you'll see are actually bracts. Okay. And if you're interested in butterflies at all, this is the host plant of uh, painted lady butterfly. Okay. Now this we're coming right towards the end of the season of cardinal flower. But this is a plant that will grow in gardens, but most commonly seen in nature in, in wet areas, like along roadsides, if there's a ditch or something with, with water in it. That's, that's the preferred uh, habitat for that bird, uh, that flower. And this is a, a favorite plant of ruby-throated hummingbirds, because the hummingbirds with the long beaks are perfectly well for getting the nectar and uh, helping to pollinate these plants. Okay. And around wetlands, this is a, this is where the common arrowhead or broad-leaved arrowhead, um, and I, I think it's an interesting name given the, the shape of the leaves and, and these beautiful blossoms. So, encourage you to uh, to get around some wetlands, and you may well be able to find some of these. These are really beautiful plants, um, and so I have images starting on August seventeenth, and the seeds form all the way on. November 12th, I photographed them there. That's the beauty of these wildflowers. You can go back to the same flowers and see them at various stages of their development. Okay. Now this is wormwood. This is a lot of people just, well, this is this is just a this is just a weed. Well, it's a weed. And by the way, if you see common wormwood with an A after it, that means it's alien. It's not native. It's it's everywhere in our country, but it's not native here. Uh, it, it disturbed soil in particular uh, is really important. This was introduced uh, into the North America in the 16th century as a culinary plant was, and, and medicinal herb. It was really very, very important. The, the uh, name common wormwood, well, what about what is wormwood? Why wormwood? Well, this plant was thought to be a, a, a medicinal herb uh, used in purging one's intestines of, of parasitic worms. So that's that's where that comes from. And mugwort comes from the idea that uh, before they had hops when they were making beer, they would put this herb into the beer to give it make it flavor. That's where mugwort comes from. From that, and just. I, I like the scientific name Artemisia. It's named for the gar, uh, goddess Ar Artemis in Greek mythology, who so benefited from this plant in this family that she gave it her name. I just think that was a nice. Okay, ground nut. This is a member of the pea family, and it's more of a vine than I mean, it's a it's a perennial vine. It can grow up to really quite long. 10, 12 feet long. I think it has a really beautiful blossom there. Uh, and the, the beans that form on this uh, pea are edible. Um, and it was also known as potato bean or Indian potato because this was an important um, uh, food source for native peoples here. Okay. Now this is, a, this is a plant that you want to avoid. This is stinging nettles, okay? Uh, and so, it's, it can be a problem. I remember walking into a patch of this and for the next uh, three or four hours, it was really irritating. It, it passes away after that, but if you can avoid it, that's really um, a good thing. So if you see a plant like that, try try to avoid it. Um, it'll be a good thing. You know, a lot of plants grow upright in order to reach for the sun. And they're putting a lot of effort into uh, having a stalk to get them above where they can reach ab above other vegetation so they can get to the sun. Well, there are a lot of plants like this uh, climbing false buckwheat um, that is in the buckwheat family, but it makes no pretense about growing high on its own. It just grows over other plants. And so it can sprawl over things and it, it can grow very fast. It can grow up to 20 feet in one season. 
So it's not putting a lot of effort in trying to go up. It just grows on everything. And it just, and the seeds are either in uh, bird or uh, wind dispersed. If you see the, the seed pods on the, on the right, those are getting to the mature stage. Velvet leaf, I've been seeing those in blossom around our area. Again, this is a not another non-native uh, name for it. This is in the mallow family. And uh, the plants in this seg in this group are the or you know, marshmallows. That's where they came from. Okay, so that's where that uh, original marshmallows came from this plant. And th this is could be a really problem because it could get into farmer's field and cause just outcompete other plants of that nature. And to think about this plant in terms of the, the seed pods in the lower right-hand corner of the image, a plant can produce up to 17,000 seeds. So you can see how this could take over large areas, especially disturbed soil like farm fields where the seeds would get a really good start, okay? So Gerardia, and, and you might notice under the, I have a uh, small flower Gerardia and small flower uh, Galilisus, okay? Notice that this, the scientific names have changed because as scientists learn more and more about them, I've given the scientific name, which is currently accepted, and the one in the parenthesis is the one that it was in in the prior times. So, so this is a plant that very often grows around um, uh, the roots of oak trees. Uh, it's a hemiparasite. In other words, it, it produce it has leaves. It can produce a chlorophyll. It can pr produce uh, nutrients, but it also is slightly parasitic on the roots roots of oak trees. So, so we have some like Indian pipes that are completely parasitic. Here's a plant that is both parasitic and can produce its own root. But it's a really beautiful blossom. Notice in the center image how there's tiny little fuzz around the, the blossom. It's really nice. So uh, moths, uh, butterflies like to feed on that where they can reach the long tongues in and get um, the pollen. Here, this is fertile false foxglove. This is another hemiparasite uh, typically found around oak trees. So this is uh, a, a really nice plant. Uh, and the next one, this is green-headed coneflower. I've been seeing those around our area in Blossom. I'm, I live in Newburyport. Um, and so this is, notice how the, in this case, the petals tend to be reflected. A lot of, a lot of petals are right underneath the center portion of the, of the plant. But in this case, typically of it, they are slightly reflected away from the other thing. So, so if you like goldenrods, and boy, this is the time of year for goldenrods. Or I mean, starting in the um, very end of July, mid, mid early August, and on, this this is uh, a member of the goldenrod family. Except it's called silverrod. It's the only member of this genus, Solidago, that is white, not yellow. So that is, it's a golden rod, even though it is not golden. Okay. Now, some, some plants that we see just, we sort of, sort of, I mean, I dismissed this, so I just kept walking by it. There was a patch of this, and it, it I mainly saw what was in the right-hand photograph, which is this, the seed heads from the prior year. I, I just sort of ignored it because it didn't look like much of interest. Until one day I just stopped and I, I looked at it and then notice the, this is the uh, uh, round headed bush clover. And just, just if you look at the bottom image, just these are tiny little flowers. They're only a quarter to a half an inch across. But I really encourage you if you have a small magnifier, if you go in the field, it really is worthwhile stopping and taking a look at these. These are in blossom now and will be out of blossom within next week or so but just sometimes the most unassuming plant can really have beautiful blossoms to it well if you like orchids this is one this is nodding ladies tresses it's a member of the orchid family um and one of these the, the interesting things about uh, most orchids i think practically all orchids is that uh, when the seeds are produced 
they have almost no nutrients associated with that seed. Okay, so when it falls into the ground, in order for them to germinate and grow, they need the assistance of mycorrhizal fungus. The fungus basically attaches itself to that seed and brings nutrients that it's getting from the leaf material of the soil around, or in some cases from the roots of other plants, and bringing nutrients to these orchids. Uh, and then in time, as the orchids develop and start producing uh, food, there's the mycorrhizal fungus will take back some of the nutrients. But I, I just think that the relationships among the so many of these plants and the mycorrhizal fungus, which are absolutely, that fungus is absolutely critical for the development and health of our forests and things like that. Uh, these relationships I find very interesting. This time of year is a very good time for Joe Pie Weed. There are a number, there are at least three different types, four different types of Joe Pie Weed here in uh, New England. Uh, this happens to be the coastal one, although it looks very, very similar. The way you can tell them apart is by looking at the venation of the leaves and counting how many blossoms there are in each bunch that you see uh, on the left-hand side. But this is a wonderful plant for uh, butterflies and pollinating bees and things of that nature. So it's a very, very important plant. And it's basically at the height of its blossoms right now. So if you go out and you you look at Joe Pye weeds and try to figure out which ones they are, it can be very, very difficult. I'm quite sure they're, they're hybridizing uh, because some plants have characteristics of one and some have characteristics of the other. But this is a nice one. And if you go out in the field, look for um, pollinated insects and, and butterflies. Okay, beggar ticks. This is devil's beggar tick. This is um, a, a plant like uh, sort of shaded areas, a little bit, a little bit damp. And the, the name beggar tick is sort of, it's, the, the name alludes to uh, an irritant befitting a beggar who keeps, because as you'll see the, the, the seed in the bottom right hand corner, they, they stick to your, you walk through a patch of this and you're just covered with these, um, uh, these seeds that stick into your clothing. Well, they also stick into the fur of, of animals. So they, we'll talk about a very, very effective way of distributing your seeds, and this is certain ones. So, okay. This is a, it's called swamp smart weed. We have a lot of uh, smart weeds around. This is one that could be both on ground, on land, and in swamps. The image in the upper right hand corner, this is a part of a reservoir, uh, which is in West Newbury, Massachusetts. Uh, and so called artichoke reservoir, but in some of the really still water, here the swamp uh, smart weed is just growing, think of it as a raft in the in the still water in the reservoir. So they don't have to be attached to the ground, although they can be. And notice the stalk, stalks are really up straight. A lot of smart weeds come and turn over, you know, sort of nod. But just if you think of this, this plant here, it's just, the, the tiny little blossoms, the blossoms that, that are open, as you can see in the center, are only about three-eighths of an inch across. But it's really, really beautiful. And But notice the stamens, in the case of the male reproductive parts, of the, are sticking way out from the rest of them. Sometimes they're really buried within the flower. Okay, okay this is flax-leaved aster. Really nice, again, another plant of, of fields and things of, of that nature. Um, so, and if you touch this flower, it's perfectly safe to do so, but the leaves are sort of, uh, they're stiff, but they sort of, uh, a little bit sharp to the touch. Okay, pretty well. Now you want to talk about, we, we talked about uh, the orchids, how they would you work with mycorrhizal uh, fungus in order to get nutrients from the surrounding soil and from other plants. Well, this is the bladderwort. This is the creeping bladderwort. And it's it's the blossom is a quarter to a half an inch across. So this is, I took these photographs in a very small pond. Okay, These plants can live just floating in the water or if the water level... Uh, goes down, they can live on the muddy bank of the little pond. But the bladderwort, well, what is with the name bladderwort? Well, they have they have bladders underneath the water that helps them float. 
But they also do another thing. It also is a trap for tiny little organisms that are in the water. And what they will do is they will trap those organisms in the bladders, and then the little tiny organism can't get out, they die, and the plant absorbs those nutrients that are in there. Think of pitcher plants or sundews that do the same thing to supplement their uh, the nutrients. Okay. This is bugleweed, the northern one. Another name for it is northern water whorehound. Okay, but, so this it gets its uh, its scientific name or in in mythology, whorehound. Okay, the water whorehound symbolizes a plant that was struck by lightning, that was sent by the thunder god Thor. Okay, and he said sent this uh, with a bolt of lightning. So. If you go back into the names and look up these names, you could, it's like all these rabbit holes that you can go down and which are all very, very, very interesting. And the name of whore hound, it comes from the English words har and hun, meaning downy plant. Okay, so that's where that's coming out of the old English. Okay. New York American asters. This is uh, about 30 years ago, all the asters' names, scientific names, had to change uh, because it was found the idea in the scientific names is uh, priority. The first person, uh, for people who uh, describe a plant in a scientific journal or writ written down, they get the opportunity to name it. And so a lot of our asters were named, in, in this case, under, under aster, na on the aster name. But then they realized that, oh, wait a minute, some Russians had described asters, or what, what we were calling asters, under a different scientific name. So all the things that we were calling asters that were related to each other had to change their name because they weren't the same asters as they were seeing in Russia, if that makes any sense to you at all. Okay. Okay. So here is another um, beggar tick. Notice this, the, the other ones had only two. Uh, Arns, A-R-N-S. In this case, there are four of them. And boy, you can see, they, they look like, uh, I remember as a child, people would go eel hunting, okay? And they would have a spear that had the, the tip, similar to what you see here. Very effective for grabbing on to, to something, whether it's clothing, clothing or uh, fur. Th th that is a wetland plant. Here's another wetland plant. Again, if you go around this a place where it's quite wet or small pond, things of that nature, this is a member of the Borage family. Um, and it gets, no, notice the scientific, it has to do with a mouse's ear, okay? In terms of the, the shape of the leaves. Okay, now this is white snake root. This is another plant that's coming into, it's a member of the aster family, okay, which is good. And it has all these beautiful white blossoms that you see here. And early settlers in in the colonies had the belief that the, uh, the rhizomes, the bitter rhizomes were a possible cure, what was a cure for snake bite. And so that's where that snake root name. So many of our plants that we have in New England were brought here. That's why so many of them have an A or alien, because they were brought for a purpose. They were thought to either have a medicinal or a culinary advantage. Think of the dandelion, which is a plague in some people's backyards. I sort of like them. But anyway, it was brought over because it was a very rich source of vitamin A and C. And, and you can actually, some uh, grocery stores, you can buy dandelion greens as a, as a good thing. So, and the scientific name for dandelion comes out of the Persian for the idea of a pharmacy because it was thought to have very important medicinal properties. So a lot of these plants were, were brought here. We might not like them, okay, some of the non-native, but they were brought for a purpose, okay? So here's a, a goldenrod. This is, again, the type of, the time of year, this your golden rods are really good. And then notice the leaves on it. This is common grass leaf. It have, based on most, compared to most uh, golden rods, these leaves are very, very narrow and very, very long. 
So this is just one of these uh, uh, very, I think I've uh, photographed 14 different types of, of goldenrods here. And this is a very distinctive one, which is good. Member of the um, Astro family again. And one of the key aids to field identification, if you look very carefully in the right image, the lowest leaf that goes off to the, to the right, it has three very distinct parallel veins to it. So a lot of cases, uh, identification of these plants, it sure it's a goldenrod, but which goldenrod is it? They'll be asking you to, well, what, what are the veination of the leaves look like? This is a plant that's in blossom now. This is, this is uh, I took this uh, September 17th. It's coming, coming soon. This is tall goldenrod. Yeah. And Solidago, again, that genus name. And so uh, what I'm giving you, Solidago, that, that is the genus name. In this case, it says it's to make, to heal or to make whole. So again, people thought that this was an important plant for medicinal purposes. Okay. Small white aster, member of the aster family. So this is the, the blossoms here are just about a quarter of an inch to half an inch across. So we're talking about tiny little blossoms, something to look for at this time of year. Now this is, uh, this is ornamental jewel weed or Himalayan touch me not. In the middle image, top middle image, that's the seed pod that's almost ready uh, to explode. And if you, when it is ready to, to if you touch it, just like on our, the jewel weed that's native to our area, it will blow up and throw a seed. That's one way of seed dispersal. But I mean, I think that blossom, okay, it's non native. I understand that, but it's still certainly a really beautiful uh, plant and it can come on the same plant. You can either have uh, pink ones or you can have white ones. This is a beautiful time of year now where the American asters are coming into blossom very, very soon. Uh, and this is New England American aster or Michaelmas daisy is another name for it. Now, why Michaelmas? Well, that is, this plant comes in, in Europe, in England, where most of our English names are coming from. Um, that is, they come into blossom around St. Michael's Day. And that's why it's a Michaelmas daisy. So that comes into blossom in Europe around September 29th. Okay. Some some more golden rods. This is a really, really good one. You probably in the Lexington area, you don't have it. But if you were to drive up to a coastal areas, whether it's out to uh, Cape Cod or uh, Cape Ann or come to the North Shore where I am in Newburyport, this is a very common plant. Um, it, it's coming into blossom. I was out on uh, Parker River National Wildlife here, Palm Island. Um, in in Newburyport, New Newbury, and the blossom the the plant is not quite yet in blossom yet, but it's coming. And you have these really beautiful uh, flowers that you have in it. And if you were to see one, one of the really key uh, aids to identification is the leaves. If you touch them, they feel very leathery, because they are uh, they are living in a climate where the salt air and things and, and strong winds would tend to take away moisture out of the leaves but this is one way uh, that they cope with that. Seaside goldenrod, it's, they will be in blossom into October. So I talked to you uh, a little bit before about axles. What are axles? Well, this is axillary goldenrod. And if you notice that on most goldenrods, they have the flowers at the, the, the tip of the plant. Notice on this one, all the blossoms are, are coming or originate where the leaf is touching the stem. That's the axle. So the axillary is the, the key subject. Of it. Goldenrod, it just has a very different structure of its flowers. Excuse me one second. Okay, this is a, the, I actually photographed this on Hog Island in Bremen, Maine. I have not seen it around here, uh, but this is a plant that if you have a boggy area, this is a aster that really likes that uh, more acidic soil. 
but I, I think it's uh, really beautiful. And notice the image, the top middle image, how the, the sepals, those green things, are coming right up against underneath the, the petals. So it's, in other words, they're really tight against the rest of the flower. Okay. This is false sneeze weed, another member of the aster family. I just think the blossoms are, uh, are really pretty. Notice the middle image, the, the stem is, uh, is very distinctly grooved. Grew. Okay. Uh, and sneeze weed, it, it's not like it was the name. It, it's not like it was a cure of, of sneezes, I think, but it was used as a component in snuff that people who use it would stuff, stuff up their nose. And I guess that would uh, occasionally make them sneeze. But that sneeze weed is, again, not a cure for sneezing. It's something that you would put in uh, snuff. And the, what, what was the idea of snuff? The idea of snuff was you put it up your nose so you'd sneeze and that would purge you of evil spirits. Okay, I, I'm not sure it works, but that was where that name comes from. Now, if you come along the, the seashore, these are salt plants of the salt marsh. They have to tolerate very, very salty water, and they have to tolerate the difference between, this is along, along a little tide pool, okay, in the salt marsh, salt meadow in this case. And some, when we have no rain for a while, these pools almost dry up. The salinity level goes way high, okay, and there's very little uh, water. And then we get a very high tide, or a lot of rain, and all of a sudden, that very, very saline water is now much fresher. These are really, really tough plants. And if you look at the right image on the left-hand portion, that little white thing is the flower. Another, in other words, glasswort, because, okay, up, up in our way, uh, this again, North Shore. This is also known as pickle weed. Okay, pickle weed because uh, people would use it in their salads in the place of a crouton. So it has a little snap like a crouton would have it, and it's salty. So just some local thing. Come along the beaches, seaside spur. This is a, another salt marsh plant, highly salt tolerant. And if you have disturbed areas, we have a lot of uh, um, farms in our area, okay? And this is a, another alien plant, but this is plant goes, once a crop is harvested in the, in the summertime, these just come in in large, large numbers. And it, it, again, it's non-native, but notice the petals in this case. If you were looking at these petals, you would, and they said, how many petals does it have? You might say it has five. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, you might say it has 10, but really those are five petals that are divided. So just be aware that they can, this is common chickweed. This is another one of these plants of disturbed areas, which are really quite common. Again, agricultural fields and things like that. But it gets its name, shepherd's purse. Look at the image in the middle. The shepherd's purse is, um, I guess it's supposed to look like a, the purse that a shepherd would wear or use. Lamb's quarters. Okay. Okay, so lamb's quarters, it doesn't look like part of a lamb. Okay. It comes from an English, this is non native. In other words, the other one is pigweed, but it comes from Lamb's quarter, which was a harvest festival. In, in England, okay? And the festival was uh, associated with the slaughter of lambs and the eating of this plant. So that's where lambs quarters is coming from, the name, okay? Okay, Scotch bellflower, harebell, okay? It's a, this is the same plant that is known uh, in, uh, as bluebells of Scotland. Okay. And field thistle, this is a real pain for farmers. Okay. Um, but notice how in the middle image in the center, how the leaf is clasping around the stem. Okay, that's sessile or clasping. Okay. It has no petiole. There's no stem leading, well, from the main stem of the plant out to the leaf. The leaf is just 
pasted right on. Yeah. So purple stem, as we get into October, we get these beautiful um, American asters again. I, I just think the, the coloration, not only of the blossoms, but look at the stems. And as the flowers are opening up, you get the images that you see in the lower left-hand corner where the color is just brilliant. Amazing. This is another, I saw a bush clover before. This is another bush clover that we have in, this is narrow leaf bush clover. And here's another Gerardia. Okay, this is again, a uh, semi-parasitic, partially parasitic plant. I think it's it's really a, a beautiful plant. Hawkweeds. This is a, another name for this is, uh, okay, the the leading naturalist in in, Ro in the Roman Empire was a gentleman by the name of Pliny, Pliny the Elder. He happened to be ki killed, by the way, in the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, but but that's okay. But Pliny was this leading scientist of the day, and he said that he saw hawks, birds of prey, coming down to this flower, eating their blossoms in order to strengthen their eyesight. And so that's where the name hawkweed is coming from. It's not true, but that's okay. Okay, that's what they thought. This is common eyebright. This is a really beautiful plant here. Again, notice in the center in all, all the well, the two images, notice inside the blossom those little purple lines. Okay. That is those purple lines are an aid to direct pollinators to where the pollen is. Peppergrass. This is another, this is a native plant. Notice the seeds, they look like, I don't, I don't know, tennis rackets or something. Okay. Wood soils. Notice the images of the, the seed pods in the upper right hand corner. They will pop when they dry, they will pop open and they can throw their seeds uh, a long distance, uh, up to 15, 16 feet away. Another great way of seed dispersal similar to uh, some of the other plants we talked about, touch me not, for example. Okay, this is common mallow. Okay. This is a, a, a non-native plant, but notice it, it, another name for this common mallow is cheeses, okay? And where the name cheeses come from? Well, if you look at the image in the lower right-hand corner, you see those round things? Apparently to some people that looked like a round, a block of cheese that you'll see in major markets and things like that. So common mallow or cheeses. I think the blossoms, again, they have the stripes to help the pollinators find the pollen. Another beautiful milkweed, I'm sorry, goldenrod here that we have. Notice the pollinating bumblebee on it. Very important for pollinators. And a lot of uh, people that have pollinator gardens have goldenrod as one of their um, important plants. Yellow cress, just some of these. Here's another goldenrod, wrinkled leaved. If you look at the leaves, they do look wrinkled. So that's a, a good thing to look for. Gray goldenrod. Notice the stems here on the one on the right. Notice that it has hairs. Well, they're not hairs. Only mammals have hair. But they have these hair-like structures that in this case are oppressed. They're pushed up against the stuff. They're not sticking out like on some plant. So that's a gray golden up. This is Jimson weed. And car well, it's carpet, called carpet flower because when they start growing, they grow in colonies and masses. And so you know, could take over your lawn or in this case, this was from a farm field. Bed straw. Okay, you tell the bed straws apart by counting the number of leaves in the world. In this case, if you see there are six, you can have eight. Other bed straws have 10. And that's one of the key aids to identifying these plants. And why bed straw? Well, when they were colonial days, things like that, long time ago, when you would make your a mattress out of uh, straw and things of that nature, they would incorporate some of these plants because they have a very uh, attractive aroma to them. So this was a way of making that mattress more, more pleasant. So bed straws, so you count the leaves in the world. Okay. 
Here's another evening primroses, but this is a different type. This is small flowered. And where we showed, what I showed you before, the common evening primrose, the sepals, those things underneath the petal, were reflected. They, they faced in the other direction that the boss of the petals were. Notice the image here in the middle of the center. In this case, the sepals are up underneath the petals. So it's an evening primrose, but it's a different one. And I'm going to end up this portion of the talk with this. This is a meadow goat beard. It has really uh, nice big blossoms, and, and they get these big, big uh, seed heads at the time. So these, again, these are the plants that are in in my area, do report, which is very similar to the Lexington area, are uh, in blossoming at this time or will be coming. Notice this was in blossoming in October 30. That's just about the end of most of these uh, plants that are just coming into blossom. So you might want to look for them. So, so I hope, again, uh, with all these flowers that you'll you understand that just some of the alien plants and some of these little tiny ones, if you look at them closely, they could be, be beautiful. I'd like to do one other thing. Uh, Matt and I talked about this. This is a time for butterflies. Now, do we have some in the springtime? Of course we do. Okay. Um, spring azures, a little tiny little blue one, or morning cloak butterflies that actually overwinter as a butterfly are there. But for for most butterflies, this is the time of year that that we get lots. It's a great time to go looking for butterflies. So I'm, I'm hoping that if you go out looking for uh, wildflowers, that you'll you'll make make sure you take the time to also look for butterflies. And these are all butterflies that I saw within the last two days. So these are all here in my area and certainly would be in the fields where you are. So in the left-hand side of that, say, Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. It's one of our biggest um, swallowtails. And notice in this case, it's on red or, or purple, depending on which name you want to use, clover. And then we have the beautiful black swallowtail that's on the uh, on the right hand side. So these are basically among our biggest butterflies, and they will. I've been seeing them feeding on everything on milkweed, Joe pie weed. Um, they love zinnias, so they, they're lots and lots of different plants. These are red admiral. Oh, the one on the left is red admiral, beautiful butterfly, and the one on the white is. White Admiral, okay? This is very interesting. Uh, uh, the White Admiral and the Red Spotted Purple, which looks nothing like this, are the same species. But this is the one, this is the one that we refer to as White Admiral, because in terms of its coloring, not the colors, but the structure of the colors look similar. Right now is a really nice time to see monarch butterflies. And the one on the left hand is on common tansy, okay? And then the viceroy that looks very, very similar to it um, is right here. That's on a cone flower, by the way. But notice the difference. Well, the key field mark for the viceroy is notice on the hind wings, it has two black lines that basically parallel the outer edges of the wing. Monarch butterflies don't have that. Okay. And this is a group of birds, that, uh, sorry, a group of insects that are really hard to identify. I mean, some of them, are, in my mind, are almost impossible. But these are skippers. And a lot of butterflies called skippers. And a lot of people look at these and think, dismiss them as being moths. They're not. They're, they're butterflies. But on the, one, on the left hand, hand side is an American skipper. So from the end of its wing to the and antenna is about an inch. So we're talking small ones. Uh, and that is on wild bergamot. And the one, the silver spotted skipper is on a mint. Okay. And that is, that butterfly is, only, is one and a half times as big as the Indian skipper that you see on the, on, on the skipper, the uh, silver spotted skipper, you can see it's two antennae, which are basically aiming towards the flower. And then it's, think of it as its tongue, that black thing that goes, which is inserting into the flower. And by this way, it's getting nectar out of the flowers, but it's also pollinating the flowers. Now, the most common butterfly we have, at least in my area, is cabbage white, which you see on the 
uh, left hand side. But I mean, I'm probably walking through a community garden today. I probably saw 25 of them. Okay, and the same size, this size but different coloration, is this clouded sulfur. And so I see where I saw 25 of the cabbage whites, I saw two of clouded sulfur, but certainly uh, worth looking, looking at. One of the most beautiful butterflies to me is this American lady that's on the left hand side. Notice the, the, the detail of the hind wings, the lower, in this case, that has two eyes on it. And notice the beautiful white, very thin white stripes. And then this uh, this thistle that you see on the right hand side is being visited not only by a bee, but by a great spaniel fritillary. And coming to the end here, these are two tiny little butterflies. The one on the left hand side, American copper. But just look at the detail of the wings. It's it's really. Um, Bill, I think your audio just cut out again. Sorry to interrupt. Um, someone in the comments could just, or in the chat, could just confirm it's. Uh, okay, it says my internet. Oh, there you are. There you are. Okay, You're back now. I just got a message that said my internet yeah. is unstable. Sorry about that. <laughs> no but these two, American now. Copper and the, and the Pearl Crescent, these are little tiny little uh, butterflies. Um so anyway, that that's that's the end I have. I'd, I'd be happy to take any questions or try to answer some of your questions. Yeah, um, thank you first and foremost for this amazing talk, and as always, just such impressive photos, especially these butterflies. The the detail that you capture is so fascinating. Um, it looks like we have somebody who's raised their hand. Uh, Loretta Roach, if you're here, you should be able to unmute and ask your question if you have one. Loretta, did you have a question? Uh, all right, well, I'll uh, maybe they'll come back. But uh, if anybody has a question, please send it in the chat or raise your hand and um, and you can ask it. Um, how uh, how is there? So you, I think you said at the beginning, not to just have you reiterate information, but um, you had referenced some guides. Do those like yes. show you like where um, like a lot of these flowers, like did you just happen upon them in the wild or did you happen to, or did you know where to find like a cardinal flower, et cetera? Well, in the cases of, yeah, I mean, most of these, I just go for a walk, you know, <laughs> go for long walks. And, and the early, <laughs> in, in, the early, in the early spring, I, I go into forests. Okay. Because I know that the spring ephemerals, those, those flowers that are only around for a very short period of time uh, are going to be in the forest uh, anemones, things of that now, uh, trout lilies things of that nature are, are, are going to be in the wood, woodlands and so a blood root things like that uh, because as soon as the leaves come onto the trees those plants basically they're done for the year so i, I know that if, if i want to see some of those spring ephemerals i want to go to forest or forest edges okay at this at this time of year i most of the flower flowering plants are now in the open fields and along roadsides and forest edges okay so that and then there are a lot of plants for example uh i i love things like um uh, pitcher plants and sundews well you have to go to a, a a bog someplace a quaking bog because they they only grow in these acidic bogs um and that's why uh, they have these special adaptations in order to catch insects to supplement their diets with the nutrients that they get. So uh, most, most guys, well, all the guides, well, if I go back to, if I just go back out of here and go way back. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, for example, the Ellerman guide, the wildflowers of New England, uh, they will tell you what the habitat preference for that flower is. Okay, it's not going to say, you know, go go to Dumbback Meadow and walk out, but it will will say if you're looking for these, it will be a roadside plant, 
or it will be a forest plant. And so you could get some, some eggs. But the most enjoyable way for me is go for a walk and see what I find, you know. And then and then with the, with the, once you start doing that, then it, it becomes clear, becomes a lot easier. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask, too, I, you might have mentioned it with some of them, but are how many of these flowers are native versus not? Because I think there was one you said was like a Himalayan touch me not. Yes. Um, I, I think the statistic I saw, Matt, was that 43 percent of the flowering plants that we have in the United States are not native. Wow. That is uh well, but if you go More to Europe, there's a lot of plants that are not native either that they came right. from this direction or from Asia. So right. it's just, uh, there, are, there are these plants have this, well, when you are producing 15,000 seeds, the mm. chances of getting one or two or three or four of them established <laughs> somewhere else are pretty high, you know? Yeah. So, and a lot of these plants, the uh, non-native plants are, don't have any natural, um, you know, no, no natural well not predators but things that lead them you know so right right yeah that's really interesting there's uh two uh two questions that came in uh the first one is um i think you get this one a lot but what type of camera and lenses did you use for these photos okay well thank you for the thank you for the question uh i i can i can hold it up for people <laughs> okay this is this is a nikon p1000 and so it's it's relatively heavy, but this is uh, it's it's twenty four to three thousand millimeters. Okay, so with that camera, That's I can get with with I can get the lens within three inches of a wildflower. That's why I can get some of these relatively close ups, or I can use it's basically the same as a telescope. Okay, in terms of getting birds that are quite a distance away. Now, it takes a little bit of, well, it takes some time and manuals to read and some time to use it effectively. But once you get the hang of it, the other beautiful thing about it is you can put it on manual focus. Okay, so you're not relying on, uh, on. Uh, so it's really beautiful if you have a bird in a tree or a flower in among other flowers that you want to photograph. If you have just automatic focus, the camera doesn't know what to do sometimes, okay? But if you switch it to manual focus, then you could, even if the bird or something is stuffed in among leaves, the camera isn't going to focus on the leaves in front of it. You can focus on the bird that's behind those leaves. So this camera is, I, I found it effective. It's, for a lot of people, it might be a little bit heavy. But this is the 3000, but I see photogra photographers going out that have a lens that's two and a half to three feet long, that's a 800. Wait a minute, mine is a 3000. Now I don't use it at 3000 because that's really too far away. But it'd be, even if I'm using it only as a thousand, it's, it's a, it can be a very, very effective uh, camera. I hope, yeah. hope that answered that. I, I think it was a good answer. There's a, another question that came in, and maybe this can be the last one is, but um, do you have a similar program on uh, fungi? I uh, no, that's that. I just took all this. By the way, I was going to actually I put the butterflies in this presentation, but I actually thought to put some fun, uh, fungi in here. Okay, but quite honestly, I just don't know enough about them to talk about. But this is the time to be outside to walk through a wetland to look for fungi. Boy, I mean, there are some in the. The variations in terms of fungi are just incredible okay, in terms of the, the diversity of colors and, and shapes. And so if you have to take a walk in the woods, especially if it's slightly damp, this is a time to do it for fungi. Yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah. Well, but, but if you're with fungi, I'd, I'd be very careful not to touch them unless you I, really know what you're doing. Of course. Well, yeah. Them. Well, um, I just want to thank you again, Bill, for another really informative talk um, and amazing photos. Uh, Bill will be back on uh, Tuesday, October 24th to talk about South Carolina uh, and traveling there. And uh, you can sign up on carrylibrary.org. Thank you so much, Bill. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Matt, I always appreciate working with you. Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone.